Time magazine called this the photo of the century, which could definitely be argued, but it's certainly the most famous photo ever taken by Henri Cartier-Bresson. What you see in this photo is a man, somewhat blurry, leaping off a small ladder lying across a thin layer of water. At least we think it's a thin layer of water. It could be a wide puddle, or there might be a deeper hole the man is jumping over. But from this shot, it's hard to tell. The ladder itself looks handmade from discarded pieces of unused lumber, and it mimics the railway in the background. There are small rivulets of surface waves pushing off the ladder from the man's weight having left its support. It appears to be some construction site. There's a pile of rubble in the background, what appears to be broken barrel bands, a wheelbarrow, and areas of the ground that has been disturbed from work. Beyond the gate, there are rooftops. One off to the left has a clock facing the direction the man is jumping towards. Plastered on a wall, nearly running parallel with the cast iron fence, is an ad for a circus called Ralowski. On that poster is a dancer leaping into the air as well, almost mimicking the man leaping from the ladder, while the name of the circus company almost mimics the rails in the background. It is an image that sums up Cartier-Bresson's philosophy on photography, which surrounds itself around recognizing the importance of a particular instance and encapsulating it with the geometry of a scene. There are two things Cartier-Bresson seemed to pay particular mind to in his own photography. The pleasure of geometry and the decisive moment, also the name of his most famous book. In fact, it's hard to read anything about Henri Cartier-Bresson without coming across the phrase, the decisive moment. Cartier-Bresson has said, To take photographs means to recognize simultaneously and within a fraction of a second both the fact itself and the rigorous organization of visually perceived forms that gives it meaning. It is putting one's head, one's eye, and one's heart on the same axis. And that in itself speaks to this famous image. But why is it so famous and why is it so highly regarded? Let's look at the composition. The first thing your eye is drawn to in this image is of the man leaping above the water. The reason why we're drawn to this is for several reasons. The eye is typically drawn to three things in a photograph. The brightest part, the most in-focus part, and the area of most contrast. And with this image in particular, you have all three concentrated in one zone. First, you have the bright sky being reflected in the water and your eye is led through this water by the reflection of the cast iron fence being reflected and pointed down to the reflection of the man's figure. The latter lying in the water is the area of sharpest focus and it also acts as a pair of leading lines which aims right towards the man in mid-jump. Not only that, but there is a shape being made by the man's spread apart legs and the reflection which looks almost like an arrowhead or diamond shape pointing into the direction of where the man's foot may land. Furthermore, his foot is only about an inch above the water's surface which creates this tension in the viewer knowing what is about to happen but not being able to see it. Finally, the darkest part of the scene is in fact the man himself. Positioned right in front of the brightest part of the scene, giving the eye an anchor point like how well defined a word is on the printed page. If that's not enough, the man in mid-jump has a slight motion blur which gives the impression of movement and kinetic flow. Beyond what we initially see, we can do some further investigation into the background. One of the most serendipitous things about this image is the appearance of a poster towards the back advertising a circus. There appears to be a female dancer in what's called a split leap. Her silhouette marks the closed loop within a stylized number nine as well as appearing to mimic a more elegant shape of the man leaping from the stepladder. 
I find details like this to be happy little coincidences because from this point a person could notice other bits of coinciding details. There's the name Ralowski. Not only is it a play on the railway behind the fence, but the rails constructing the ladder in the water. The hands on the clock, hard to see but it's there, points down towards the man and faces in the same direction he's headed. Also, the rooftops of the buildings appear to disappear towards the left but become sharper to the right as they angle down again towards the leaping man. So are we reading too much into this? Is this a constructed scene or truly a moment of colliding happenstances? There are a few things that can be said about the construction of this image, both before it was shot and after. Cartier-Bresson notoriously didn't like cropping his images, and this image we have here is one of only two that he ever cropped. He had a strong distaste for darkroom techniques, and to prevent editors from cropping his images, he sent his work out with a black border, the frame he intended when he snapped the shot. However, he wasn't able to do that in this instance. He said, There was a plank fence around some repairs behind the gas St. Lazare train station. I happened to be peeking through a gap in the fence with my camera at the moment and the man jumped. The space between the planks was not entirely wide enough for my lens, which is the reason why the picture is cut off on the left. Throughout his life, Cartier-Bresson had championed the philosophy of the decisive moment, and with the Derrière la Guerre de Saint-Lazare photo, he proved he was the right person at the right moment. If this image was taken today, would so much attention be piled upon it? Probably not. We typically scroll past images of people frozen in air, would just chalk it up as being photoshopped or the result of a constructed scenario. But this was taken around 90 years ago. This was the time when almost all cameras were placed on tripods and were cumbersome to deal with. But for Henri Cartier-Bresson, he had just got his hands on a new Leica camera. It was highly portable, allowing him to get images like this without lugging around a large camera and tripod stand. Henri Cartier-Bresson had an interesting life. He was born into a wealthy family which afforded him the opportunity to explore his creative endeavors, which started with painting and eventually moved into photography. It was in his initial studies as a painter that he learned to appreciate geometry, having been taught by famous Cubist painter André Lotte. Of course, this wasn't his only influence throughout his artistic journey, having crossed paths, studied, or had the pleasure of working with the likes of René Crevel. André Breton, Harry Crosby, and Gretchen and Peter Powell. After traveling and working throughout Africa, Cartier-Bresson, age 23, decided to give photography a shot. It was 1931, and by 1933, he'd have his first exhibition show at Julian Levy Gallery in New York. He photographed through Mexico as part of a geological expedition until he decided to try his hand at documentary filmmaking. This led to a job working with Jean Renoir, directing a French Communist Party propaganda film which, by no surprise now, he wasn't paid for. When World War II rolled around, Cartier-Bresson was still in the reserve French infantry and was called upon to the Army Photography Office. He was captured by the German Army in 1940 as a prisoner of war. He was transferred to a camp as part of a labor gang working around 30 jobs from laying railway lines to manufacturing cement. He unsuccessfully tried to escape imprisonment two times before finally succeeding on his third attempt. He managed to cross back into French territory where he forged papers and train tickets provided by a French sympathizer. For three months, he hid on a farm with other prisoners and Jews. When asked what the greatest journey of his life was, he responded, the three escapes. When he finally felt comfortable with his freedom, he returned home to retrieve his Leica camera. He had buried it in a secure location prior to the German invasion. He hadn't taken a photo in three years. He was eager to get back to work. Henri Cartier-Bresson paid little attention to technique, relying on experts to do his developing for him. They knew he didn't like contrasty or soft images, but favored the purity in what he saw. He used Leica cameras and typically used a 50mm lens. He said he never shot using flash, stating that using a flash was like shooting off a gun in a library. He really didn't know how many photos he took in his long 30-year career, though it's been estimated to be over half a million. Until the very end of his life, he was always drawing or photographing. 
His final days were treated with the same amount of patience he reserved for his photos. He quietly died on August 3rd, 2004, having almost reached the age of 96. The news of his passing was worldwide news. Photographer Richard Avedon lamented, he was the Tolstoy of photography with profound humanity. He was the witness to the 20th century. <laughs>